Back in the 1970s, and especially the 1980s, behind the Iron Curtain, we would routinely listen to Radio Free Europe, even though it was illegal and it was difficult to get the devices able to receive the signal broadcasted from München. Most of those listening knew full well that Radio Free Europe was a US propaganda operation partly funded by the CIA. We were aware that portions of their broadcast included either intentional or unintentional exaggeration and outright disinformation. Some of it was unintentional for, due to the difficulty of getting uh, accurate information due to the hermetic nature of uh, communist societies, particularly Albania and Romania. But others were intentional, for sure. But even so, on aggregate, if you like, most of those listening in deemed it good enough because at the very least you could still learn some things that were verboten to talk about in mainstream communist societies. Those who could not tell the difference were still overall better off because they were at least aware that there is a different narrative out there and indeed the party is not in all and everything. The regime made three mistakes. It pretended Radio Free Europe doesn't exist, it made receiving them uh, difficult and or illegal, and was content only to say Western man bad whenever anything Radio Liberty said was brought up in public, which was anyway very rare. In, May, in uh, 2016, uh, when I made the video What is Duginism and Why it Matters, the issue of Russian subversion was not on the agenda almost anywhere. So at the time, the West was basically pretending that the issue doesn't exist. Fast forward almost five years since I made that video and now the West commits the second and the third mistakes uh, to various degrees whilst overcompensating for the first, and that is terrible. <laughs> Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Alright, so an unusually short video here, by recent month standards anyway, uh, based on several conversations that I had lately with other sociologists, politologists, strategic communicators, or whatever fancy names are out there for those who don't like to be called propagandists. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the European Union, as well as NATO, has been beating the drum since 2018 about creating various instruments with fancy names that basically amount to money being funneled to various propagandists with the view to counter what they called Russian disinformation. That's neither a good thing nor a bad thing in and of itself. As always, the devil is in the details. And the details aren't bright at all. Well, unless you want further success for Russian efforts, in which case the details are great. So, let me get a bit into the details uh, and then into the structural problems or meta problems if you want, and then wrap this up. As I said, I don't want to go on for too long. So, for starters, the West is structuring this effort, um, uh, is relying more or less on a decrepit infrastructure and a decrepit mentality. NATO efforts still have Radio Free Europe as a cornerstone, which is, well, increase, increasingly less relevant. If anyone seriously believes Radio Free Europe can counter Russia today roughly and the increasingly agile and well-coordinated smaller networks, well, I have a bridge to sell to you. It took you all three years just to get close enough to start the effort. It's doubtful that it will become visible or operational in 2021 to begin with. So it will have been four years since you decided you need this and until implementation. By 2022, roughly none of the wisdom used in 2018 to kickstart the project will have been useful. Yeah, that's what I call 
decrepit. Use 1950s institutional infrastructure, 1970s propaganda methods with 2018 knowledge in the year 2022. Yeah, that will work. <laughs> Meanwhile, the European Union is aiming for a fascist light model in which the Commission collaborates with platforms and stakeholders through various carrots and sticks in the form of quasi-legalized tax evasion and dubious fines for dubious antitrust violations. All fine and dandy until you look at the concrete tools, some of them tried out in beta testing during the panic for this particular fluffy cough from Wuhan. But once you take a look at these concrete tools, you realize that it's even worse than that, uh, than the NATO version. I mean, the NATO version at least has some institutional accountability. What the European Union is proposing not only lacks accountability, but it incentivizes counter-selection by relying on NGOs whose existence depends on EU grants. Or by relying on third-party non-EU actors like Snopes, for instance, or other similarly themed organizations formed by two liberals and their cats. Now, don't get me wrong, I love cats, I really do, but I also love the truth a bit more. The, f the model um, with so-called fact-checkers has zero institutional accountability, or in plain English, there is no answer to the legitimate question of who checks the fact-checkers. And on top of that, in addition to being agenda-driven, oftentimes with their own anti-Western agendas, even if not Russian per se, many of these so-called fact-checkers are just dumb. Oftentimes they pull honks, um, and it's not because they're evil or agenda-driven, but just because they're stupid. Which is fine, after all, stupidity is relatively equal everywhere. But in the EU model, you'd have unaccountable stupid on top of that. And that is terrible. And it's terrible because that's the fastest way to ensure a plummeting of trust. We've seen a lot of that over the last 12 months. Enough of our fellow citizens have uh, seen the fact-checkers' ability to be stupid in public about things 70-80% of the populace was able to check physically for themselves, so naturally the level of trust decreased heavily. So what makes you think they'll suddenly trust uh, the exact same people about more nuanced things? EU's own barometers indicate that this isn't happening. But then again, bureaucrats can't even be bothered to read their own documents, let alone be persuaded by outside reason. And then there's the structural problems part, which cannot and will not be solved by any of these initiatives, and in fact solving them will be a complicated matter. But to solve those, one would have to, first and foremost, admit that those issues exist in the first place, and also that the state cannot exactly fix them, least of all the European Union as a state actor. Now, I don't pretend to know all of the structural problems related to Russian disinformation, but I do insist that I'm not blind, probably because my glasses aren't that bad. <laughs> Anyway, so the first one, the first structural problem, is the fact that our press is terrible. Now, don't get me wrong, the press in Europe has been terrible for over a decade, or depending on your, uh, of your uh, threshold, maybe even more than that, but it's gotten progressively worse in most NATO countries. Take, for instance, the protests that occurred in Europe in relation to the honk-tier sanitary fascism under the excuse of this fluffy cough from China. I covered many of them in the Romanian language podcast, especially those which had in attendance some, someone in the circles related to this sofa. But one big problem was that one couldn't easily find decent enough footage for most of these protests anywhere outside Rupley. In fact, Rupley even live broadcasted on the internet even small protests from all over Europe. And Rupley also broadcasts protests and other political events appearingly in an indiscriminate fashion or indiscriminately. For those who don't know, Rapli GmbH is a German-based video agency located in Berlin on Lillestrasse 1, 
which just so happens to be right next to the Brandenburg Gate, but on the eastern side and in an area that was, and yes, still is, rife with KGB conspirative locations, or safe houses if you want. I know, I know, it's just a coincidence, even though Rapli GmbH makes no secret of the fact that it is a subsidiary of Russia Today, you know, the state-controlled Russian news outlet. Rapli's slogan? News that expands views. Now, over the last two or three years, the West, in its limitless stupidity, has transformed abruptly into what Radio Free Europe was for us behind the Iron Curtain 40 years ago. Obviously, this is advantageous for Russia, especially given that they didn't even have to engage in much persuasion effort to achieve this status. Almost all of its work was done for them by the Western establishment. Every anti-immigration protest, every yellow vest protest, every footage from of the hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants marching through Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, Hungary, and North Macedonia, every protest against the illiberal and fascistic measures justified by idiots in the name of this cough, all of these, when seen and pointed out by normal people, were greeted with Russian man bad. That's it. No argument allowed. The footage comes from RT, therefore it's Russian propaganda. Just like 40 years ago when a normal person would say, look, I've heard on Radio Free Europe that the numbers in economics and production laid out by the party are wrong. Here's the calculation that they offered. It's simply impossible for the official number presented by Pravda to be correct. That person would be greeted with Western man bad. That's it. No argument allowed. How dare you listen to Radio Free Europe? It's from the West, therefore it's American propaganda. This shows a rudimentary understanding of propaganda. And whilst in the 1980s one could be excused, at least in part, because the knowledge was still not fully available, such an attitude in 2021 is inexcusable. The effect, unfortunately, is slowly going in the same direction as it did 40 to 50 years ago. At first, people were scared enough by the argument that's Western propaganda and stopped asking further questions. But as time went on, enough people, especially the smarter ones, ended up with the conclusion that even though Radio Free Europe was a propaganda outlet, it was still preferable to the establishment communist propaganda because it clearly contained a superior dose of reality and a smaller dose of intentional exaggeration and disinformation. The same is slowly happening now. Back in 2016, when I made the video about Duginism, I was already complaining about the overuse of labels such as Putinist or Russian propaganda for things that were simply not that. One month after I published that video, the Trump is a Russian agent conspiracy theory became a thing, and it only went downhill from there. Over the last three years, we heard that anyone disagreeing with ma mass unfettered immigration is a Russian agent. Anyone using mathematics and statistics to show that the public narrative about the pandemic is partly or totally wrong, anyone doing that is a Russian agent. Anyone protesting against ir ridiculous, illiberal and useless pandemic rules is a Russian agent. Of course, anyone currently observing the events in France is a Russian agent. And on and on like that it went. The problem is that more and more people, after several years of this crap, are starting to say, you know what? It's not my fault that Rutley talks about the issues I care. And that is true. In Europe, there is no professional news agency that discusses topics of interest like these, other than Rutley, that is. You want to counter Russian propaganda? That's where you should start. While the United Kingdom has a bit of uh, the Telegraph, a bit of Breitbart, a bit of the Express, there is room for such discussion for sure. But what does continental Europe have other than Russian-owned Rutley? Well, there's Hungary-based Remix News, then there's Le Figaro in France, okay, but nothing agile and big like Rutley.
At the size we're talking about here, it's not even that expensive. The EU spends just in 2021 alone 75 million euros on media pluralism initiatives, most of that money going into outlets with 500 readers, or maybe 2,000 if we're being generous. Or in various meetings about media pluralism, which is basically money laundering for marginal NGOs that pay huge salaries for marginal people with marginal ideas that nobody votes for and whose utility in combating Russian or Chinese propaganda or disinformation is exactly zero. With that money, one could compete with Rupley fairly easily. With 150 million euros seed investment, one can take Rupley off the European market within three years. Partner up with the Associated Press and or Thomson Reuters and one could achieve that in two years. Now that's how you counter Russian propaganda, but then again, I want to win. The EU bureaucrats may or may not want to win, and even assuming best intentions, one still has to remember that EU bureaucrats have no pressure in achieving results. And that, my fellow plebs, is why all the talk you will hear, especially starting this summer and all the way until at least 2024 about countering Russian disinformation will be disingenuous and, quite frankly, hot air. And the few actions that will take place will be weak and inefficient, and some of them outright harmful. For instance, just to give an example, Putin is uh, a frail man, but who goes out of his way to project an image of strength. Meanwhile, this is the German Minister of Defense. Like, really. I rest my case. Let me know when you really want to win a propaganda operation. For now, Russia can beat us in this department not because it is strong, it really isn't as strong as too many naive souls think it is, but because we don't even show up on the fight. Oh, and by the way, censorship will only make things worse. The fastest way to turn RT into what Radio Free Europe was 40 years ago is to attempt even more chicanery against it. And I'm sure many fools in the governments of Europe will attempt to do just that, because of course they will. Because every generation thinks it's smarter than the previous ones, and every new politician is convinced he or she is smarter than capital P propaganda itself. That's it. That's all I had to say. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll see you all around quite soon. Cheers.